Why do we humans communicate and how? And isn't that a problem that to study communication, we have to, well, communicate? Did you ever ask yourself that? Because JP the Router did and does every day. But he's got good reasons. JP is a cognitive scientist whose primary research focus is on the cognitive foundations of human communication. He aims to improve our understanding of how humans and artificial agents use language, gesture and other types of signals to effectively communicate with each other. Currently, he has one of the two bridge professorship at Tufts University and has been appointed in both the computer science and psychology departments. In this episode, we'll look at why Bayes is helpful in dialogue research, what the future of the field looks like to JP, and how he uses PyMC in his own teaching. This is Learning Bayesian Statistics, episode 60, recorded March 2, 2022. <music> Welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics, a fortnightly podcast on Bayesian inference, the methods, the projects, and the people who make it possible. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country, and reach a true Bayesian state of mind by visiting learnbayesstats.com. That's learnbayesstats.com. Do you want to support the podcast and unlock exclusive Bayesian swag at the same time? Then you can visit my Patreon page at patreon.com slash stats. Starting at 3 euros, you can get various benefits like the private MBS Slack channel, early access to special episodes, selecting questions for episodes, or even coming on the show. You'll get more details at patreon.com slash stats. Thanks a lot, folks. I'm very grateful for any support you can bring. Let me show you how to be a good Bayesian and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Wes Bayesian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. A Bayesian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional. And when I kick a flow, mostly I'm watching eyes widen, maybe because my likeness lowers expectations of tight rhyming how would i know unless i'm rhyming in front of a bunch of blind men dropping placebo controlled science like i'm richard Feynman. before we go on with the show i wanted to share with you a small bit of the conversation i had with thomas vicky and thomas Ladet for the other podcast format i have the matchmaking dinners where two basins join and talk about what they are currently working on as if they were having dinner so here it is for you yeah yeah, if, if you could write down a hierarchical model the way that it exists on the pages of the statistical paper that describes it versus having to do the non-centered parameterization, mm. which, by the way, I feel like is the worst name for that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I still don't know which is which. I don't know which is which. I feel like the non-centered <laughs> one is centered. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You sample yeah. like the standard normal and you multiply yeah. it by, like. I feel like worst. that's centered. The other one's not centered. I don't know. No, yeah, it's like, yeah. I mean, maybe we should just come up with new name. Like, <laughs> I always Bayesian, just, a Bayesian that's stats, one. yeah, Bayesian stats summit, first summit, which is give name to give new names yeah. to every <laughs> shitty name we have. That is one where I literally every time I write it, that's like, yeah. no matter how many times I go, I have to go back to the it's scan like, manual or the like, negative yeah, binomial. Goodness. You know, it's like the negative binomial oh is God, one of my fights. Binomial. It's like you keep telling beginners, okay, so binomial is for count data and count data is positive integers. So like and then you've got negative binomial in the mix, but actually it's not a binomial. <laughs> it's not a binomial distribution. It's a gamma Poisson. Gamma Poisson would be a lot better for the negative binomial. If that sounding interesting to you, and well, my prior is that it does, just go to patreon.com slash learnbasedstats to support the show, and you'll get access to this episode and all the previous one, whatever tier you choose. So, happy exclusive listening, and now, the show must go on. Let me show you how to be a good crazy and change your predictions after taking information in. Wes Abazian is someone who cares about evidence and doesn't jump to assumptions based on intuitions and prejudice. Abazian makes predictions on the best available info and adjusts the probability because every belief is provisional.
JP de Ruiter, welcome to Learning Bayesian Statistics. Thank you for the invitation. I'm yeah, happy to be here. You bet. I'm, I'm really happy to have you here, at least for two reasons. The first one is that you were recommended by Karin Knudsen, who is here, this very podcast on episode four. And we are now in the 60s of this podcast. So that's a long time ago. That's awesome. Karin was, was one of the very first guests on this podcast. And I recommend user, uh, users, <laughs> listeners uh, who haven't heard about her amazing work to go and listen to that episode because I had a lot of fun. And it was actually one of the rare episodes that I got to record live in person with Karin, who was in front of me. So wow. that was fun. Yeah, I was in Boston at the time. So that was cool. And the second reason is that you are a fellow podcaster. So <laughs> always happy to have someone like that on my show. And I mean, you do a lot of things. So we'll, we'll get to that through the, through the episode. But first things first, let's start with your background as usual. So basically, can you give us your origin story? JP. Origin story. Uh, do you mean just me or my scientifically or what, what is the, uh, yeah, shall well. I start at my birth? <laughs> so we could make for a long episode, I guess. Usually what I'm interest, interested in is, well, what's your path? Basically, how did you come up doing what you're doing right now? So which studies did you do? How did you come to those studies. Thank you. These can be in type intertwined with also some personal right. uh, things as these for a lot of people. I understand the question. Yeah, so I started studying when I was uh, 17. I was a bit early. Uh, and uh, the only thing I could study, my parents said, the only thing you can study is law. And I didn't want to study law, but if that was the way to go and get you know, out of the house and study, so I, I, that's why. And I, okay, then I'm going to study law. Uh, mm -hmm. It was actually more interesting than I thought, but but I was actually more interested in international relations. Mm. So I moved to secretly from law to international relations and then did a sociology course, which was obligatory for that education. And in that sociology education, there was a method methodology component. And when I did that, I was just totally hooked. I was like, I, I want to be a scientist. This is so cool. Hmm. Uh, it was actually the the, 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 the example that, that flipped me on was a study by Dube and Gross, which is this famous honking study where people are sitting in cars and using stopwatches to time when people behind them at a green traffic light start honking and then comparing that with questionnaire data how how fast would you honk and then compare that with how they really honked and it was just fantastic i was like hooked <laughs> so then for financial reasons i had to stop studying and became a computer programmer for a few years but then that got really boring and then i it was in the meantime i was in nijmegen in the netherlands which is a very good university mm -hmm. so i enrolled in psychology again and then from psychology jumped to cognitive science it was quite handy that i already had a computer programming background mm -hmm. in that field uh, that was first interest in perception and uh, then i discovered the max planck institute which was right next door to the university and they did language and i'm like oh these these people are interesting so i'll switch to language and then I did my undergrad uh, thesis there and, um, and my PhD thesis. And I was a, a staff member there, what they call in Europe, they call the staff member, a sort of faculty there for a total of 18 years. And that's how I ended up becoming a scientist. But I, I was actually, it, it's almost unplanned. Every, every switch I took was, was not planned. Hmm. The one that's the most astonishing to me is um, programming thing. Because like you just ca casually dropped that, but how come like at one point you just ended up coding things? Oh, well, yeah, that's a good question. I, I, I actually skipped a step. In one of the many things I studied at the beginning in late and tried to find something I liked was uh, computer science. And, hmm. and, okay. and it was during my computer science uh, education that I had to stop for financial reasons and family reasons. And so the natural thing to do was to make my money with programming. So uh, I worked okay. at a hospital laboratory mm -hmm. as a process controller, writing process control software for laboratory computers. Mm, okay, okay, I see. So you said that what hooked you was the methodology course. Yeah. I'm curious why. Like, yeah, why I mean, did you just realize, oh, that's what I want to do? I don't know. Well, first of all, there was this other thing that we learned about drilling cores in garbage belts to find out what people's lives were like in the past. That I mm -hmm. thought was very clever. 
And the other thing with the Dubin Gross study, which is fantastic, and I'll share it in a link if, if you allow me. It's oh, yeah, so good. For sure. Where they actually asked people things in the survey and then actually looked at their real behavior. And mm -hmm. it turned out that their real behavior is very different from their uh, survey answers. And I always suspected that as a survey out, fill outer, you know, that this is not a real way to, to get at data. So suddenly I was, I was sort of intoxicated by the possibility of finding out things about the world by, by just collecting the right data. That was just mm. fascinating. It was so much more interesting than blah, blahing about uh, law or international relations, in my view at that time. And I still yeah. think that <laughs> it was the, the, the power of empirical data that, that sort of turned me on. Nice. Yeah. So I love that because I basically have the same. I basically have the same path. Uh, it's, oh, it's really? really oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's very funny because. It's, it's, it's Did like, you start yeah. as a lawyer too? <laughs> no. So that I. Not that I, bad. I, yeah. No. I. Okay. <laughs> I realized very very fast with like within like the first or second law class that. This wasn't for me, uh -huh. but I did dip quite a lot in, in international relations. Oh. And that's empirical data that, that got me out of ah. that into the nerd world. Yes. <laughs> well put. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, yeah, so that's super interesting. And nowadays, you're in Boston, right? You're, you're no yeah. longer in, in the Netherlands. Well, how would you define what you're doing? Today. After this weird period in uh, the Netherlands, jumping from study to study, ending up at the Max Planck Institute, I think a crucial p point was when I was working again as a computer programmer in Leiden, writing scientific software for the department there. And uh, I had let known the director of the institute, Milam Leveld, of the Max Planck, that I was interested in doing a PhD. And then one day, out of the blue, he called me up on the phone. I'll never forget. He's like, hey, JP. I have this really crazy project here. Do you want to do it? And it sounded like he was actually something that he really found crazy and that he had to do it. And you want to be on it. And I, I, I'm like, okay, yeah, I want to do it. I don't care what it is. It turned out to be project on gesture, human gesture, the gestures people make when they speak. And, uh, and I was like, okay, let's dig into that. This was another switch that happened uh, sort of un planned. So I, I then we started working on a, a process model on integrating gesture and speech. And that's where I actually became interested in the interaction. In, in, because you, you don't speak normally, you don't speak just for yourself, or well, we do, but that's not the primary function of it. Uh, it's dialogue, the thing we're doing now, that is actually making us social beings. And that is also a large part of our daily lives. And, uh, and it's actually mysterious. It's totally mysterious how we do that. It looks very trivial, but it isn't. And so I got really interested in dialogue. And also because of the group we found, founded at the Max Planck Institute, the Multimodal Interaction Project, which I founded with Nick Enfield. And that was really fascinating. And uh, at some point, I then was appointed in Germany. And I did the same work. And I always felt a little bit uneasy because at the Max Planck, it was a linguistics institute or psycholinguistics. But then, a psycho so I was basically more a psychologist. But then in Germany, I was at the linguistics department and everybody was like, what are you doing with these psychologists and computer scientists? And I always felt like, like I was between two worlds. And at some point, I even applied for a job in the UK. And the dean, I remember the dean said to me, so look at all these things you do. What do you want? And I'm like, well, everything you know it's it's all connected i like it so then i came back and i didn't take that job and at some point there was a, an advertisement for tufts university that they were looking for a bridge professor and it was bridge professor was defined as a as someone who works in at least two out of three fields and the three fields were the psychology philosophy and computer science hmm. and linguistics would also be nice so and I was basically, you know, sort of working in, in at least three of them and, and also I'm an amateur philosopher, as Dan Dennett always says, which I will take as a compliment. So, you know, I thought like, well, even though Boston is far away in another continent and I'm quite happy in Germany, I would just have to apply. So I applied and I actually then at some point got invited and went over and it was really, really interesting because the application project, uh, pro, uh, application procedure in the US is much, much more elaborate than in Germany. In Germany, you just have someone give a talk for half an hour and then bye-bye and then, then it, that's it. Whereas I was in, in Tufts for three days having like very many, I think a total of 35 people that I met. And I really liked the atmosphere. I really liked the, the people, mostly. 
So, uh, I mean, I also like the university itself, but the people were the best part. So I like, okay, let's jump in. And and then I became a bridge professor. Now it's it's actually a plus that I'm in two fields instead of just just a, a nuisance and people asking me about my identity and stuff. Hmm. So that's how I ended up in Boston. So now I hear I'm, I'm I've I've built up a lab to study human interaction mm-hmm. from a cognitive point of view. Nice, yeah. That, that sounds super interesting, and we'll get to that very soon. But first, I would like to ask you if you remember when you first got introduced to patient stats and why were they attractive to you? I remember that really well because <laughs> it's not that long ago. <laughs> that helps with the memory. Huh. Yeah, sure. uh, <laughs> I think actually I was, last week. <laughs> yes. So I, I remember it was, uh, I was early 40s when I just worked in Germany. And I had always been incredibly unhappy with what people called statistics. All around me, people were doing the weirdest things. And, you know, at some point, a, a fam- now famous researcher told me when I was a grad student, like, oh, it's very hard to prove that something is not true. You just name, take fewer data points and it never gets significant. And I was like, something is fishy about that logic. I mean, mm-hmm. that it's harder, it's easier to prove by using less data didn't make sense to me. Mm. And also people were, there, there was this other notion of if you really wanted something to be true, you just throw more data at it, run more subjects. And at some point you'll get that bloody number under the 0.05 and then you publish it. So there was like a sense that statistics was a way to measure how hard you worked. <laughs> and that felt very, very weird. So yeah. I had this like, but at the same time, I was not a statistician and all these gurus around me said, oh, JP, that's how it works. Okay. But I was unhappy about it. And it was also inconsistent somehow. At some point, that was very funny. My wife, was, who's also a researcher, was struggling with a multiple comparison issue. Ah, uh, of course. And she, she was like, okay, so how many tests could I do? And do I have to divide the p-value by all these tests? And, and this is a bit weird. So then she stumbled on a footnote by Gelman. There is a famous footnote by Andrew Gelman somewhere. I, I don't know where it is. I tried to find it. But really? Incredible. <laughs> and <it> footnotes. <laughs> famous footnote. <laughs> well, that's, for us. That's, for us. Yeah, that's I don't another know genre of literature. <laughs> yes. Well, uh, actually, and I have an entire research project based on a famous footnote. Oh, that's another one as well. So footnotes are important. And this Gelman footnote basically said, don't sweat it with the multiple comparisons. If you do the Bayesian analysis, you don't have to worry about it. And then Laura, my wife, said, well, what, what is this Bayesian analysis? And, uh, and she came to me and we talked about it. And, we st- and I started Googling, what is Bayesian analysis? And I quickly landed on a page, a very wild homepage, but it was a very Dutch looking guy who had a big grin on his face playing mini golf and around that picture of him playing mini golf were all these like Bayesian propaganda articles. So I started reading them and this was of course EJ Wagemakers. So uh, I just called him up by phone and I said, hey listen, I'm here in Germany. I'm interested in these Bayesian statistics. Can you come over and and give us a seminar about it. And he said, oh yeah, I'm happy to do that. So we jumped on the train, we came over to Bielefeld. This was in 2010, I think. And he gave my department a whole um, sort of quick course on Bayesian statistics. Then with Winbugs, which is of course horrible software, but but he made it work. And so we became friends and he was a great help in, and basically, so he was like my, my, my statistical therapist. He was like, no, no, JP, it is normal that you think these things are weird because they are weird. And uh, it doesn't have to be weird if you use the right kind of statistics that's based on probability theory. I'm like, whoa, I have never heard of this. So... But I was really quickly, because I had all these frustrations built up for almost 20 years of scientific frustration about p-values and, and HST, I was very, very willing to, to convert. And EJ was a great help in that. And he was very patient because there were some things that at the beginning I really didn't get. <laughs> he was like very patient, like, no, no, it's you really need to have a prior, otherwise you... There is no such thing as posterior. Like, okay, 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 I'll start again. In the end, I got it, I think, or at least as far as I can get it as a, I mean, it's very, it's always a difficult topic, but I was really a fan of it. So that's how I got, uh, I got into it. That's a nice story. I love it. And I'm impressed by the fact that, yeah, you had been doing something that <laughs> that was frustrating you for 20 years, yeah. but still you were able to look at it from a different point, different angle. Like you were open to 
try no, something you, else. You act as if it's something difficult, but it was a relief for me because yeah, yeah. it yeah, felt it, like I was doing weird stuff all the time. And hmm. now it suddenly felt like, okay, it's difficult and I have to work on it, but at least it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. It seems like, uh, like A.G. Wackenmacher here was the, you know, uh, what's the name of the guy in, in The Matrix who... Ah, the, uh, the red yeah, pill. Neo. He was my yeah. Neo. Yeah, no, but he. Yeah, you were handed the red pill and the blue pill. Yes, and yes, the exactly. Red pill. <laughs> yes, I chose the red Bayesian pill, and now now I'm lost. Yeah, now I know. <laughs> You're lost, but it makes sense. And exactly. Isn't that the goal? <laughs> that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, no, that's awesome. I love it. And so perfect. That's a great segue to your field, actually, and what you are doing. You talked a bit about that already, but. Can you define your field for listeners and also the topics in your field that you are particularly interested in? Yes. There's a bit tricky because I sometimes feel my field doesn't exist. And mm -hmm. I'll explain what I mean. Because I'm looking at communication as a cognitive problem. Mm -hmm. So the, basically, uh, the field, you could call it, you should call it, the cognitive foundations of communication, of human-to-human -human or human-to-machine communication. So you could say agent-to-agent -agent communication. The few people working on that field, they are in agreement that this is a really big problem. People who build robots that communicate with people are in agreement with this because they can't get these robots to communicate normally, so they know how hard it is. But cognitive scientists and psychologists tend to think it's a trivial problem because, hey, what's the deal here? I say something, you hear it, you say something back, I hear it, that's communication. It's actually quite a lot more complex than that because we have a very low bit rate between our communication and yet we get immense amounts of information across by using all kinds of mechanisms and, and ligatures and, and cognitive inferences. We are very effective in communicating even though the channel is, is noisy and low bit. So that's basically a cognitive problem. It's the human version of Shannon, basically, where Shannon had a line to work with, a modem line. And then it, it, if you have the decoder and the encoder defined, it's also a problem, but it's, it's manageable. If you don't have a decoder and encoder defined, like we humans, then it's getting really complex. So that's the general story, the cognitive foundations of communications. And the, the bit of a problem is that most people working on communication are not cognitive, and most cognitive scientists are not working on communication. So it's a bit of a, a gap there. Mm. The things that I work on, well, I started out with gesture, as I told you, to um, try to, to find out how we synchronize our gesture and speech, because there's two mysteries about gesture. One is the, where do they come from? Because we make them spontaneously. They're not like words that you learn as a kid. And not only do we make them spontaneously and shape them spontaneously, they're also very, very tightly synchronized with speech and speech production, which was the main topic, as you may know, of Willem Leveld, my advisor. He had a model of that. And I, so I created a model that integrates both speech and gesture. And I've been working on that field ever since. The second major issue that I work on is turn-taking. And that's another famous footnote. There is a famous footnote in the ultimate article about turn-taking by Sex, Shegloff, and Jefferson, which I should link in as well. I'll send you the link. Which is the most cited language paper ever. And it's, it basically defines the field of turn-taking. Mm -hmm. And they noticed, that these authors, that there's hardly any gap between what, when I stop speaking and you start speaking, or when you start stop speaking and I start speaking. So these, our turns are really lacking latching onto each other with perfect timing. Mm. And there's the famous footnotes that, uh, by Sex et al. that says how people manage to, this is a free translation, I don't remember the exact one, but how people manage to do this, you know, how they know that a turn will end so that they can start on time. Uh, that's not our concern. That's a problem for linguists and stuff. Well, that, be that became my entire project. How do people do that? And it's kind of a mystery because if you take standard psych psycholinguistics theory, it's impossible. Because if you say something, I need to process what you say, integrate it in my, in my discourse model, think of what I'm going to reply, start producing an articulation or try making an articulatory plan and then start articulating. That's at least one second. That's a, a second is, an a, is a very long time in interaction. Imagine that we would have this conversation with one second time between every turn. It would ex sound extremely awkward. And we don't do that. So the question is, how do we do this in time? No. So one of the first things I started working on is, how, what kind of cues do we use 
to do it and, and how do we do it basically and I found uh, in a series of studies I found evidence that we do that by just predicting what the other person is going to say and already planning our response in ahead of time mm. but how do we do we predict this now most people believe that it's melody intonation you know like prosody that, that they hear but and I actually believed that at the beginning too but when I did an experiment I, I it was clear that it was not at all that, well prosody helps a little bit but most of the work is done by the content we're just very good at content prediction it's funny now that there is now we know that there's a lot of prediction going on in language processing but in those days that wasn't hip yet so it was a weird idea that you could predict what people were going to say mm. so that's basically how it started and then i did uh, then I expanded in other areas so i used to do reaction time research when i was an undergrad but it's funny if you do reaction time research in interaction the reaction time is not only a reflection of processing as it is in standard cognitive psychology, it's also a signal itself. Mm. So, for instance, if people say something that we call dispreferred, like, for instance, you get invited to your best friend's wedding and you don't want to come, that is what we call a dispreferred response. Because if you get invited to your best friend's wedding, your the preferred response is to say, oh, yes, that's great. Of course I'll come. If you don't want to come because, I don't know, because you have a, an exam or, or a childbirth or whatever reason, you will not actually be very quick in your response. You will have a delay, and the delay signals your hesitancy to say no. This is the short summary. I mean, if people who are actually experts on this would hear me, they would try to strangle me, but this is the, the, the simple explanation. Mm. You, you say something that's a dispreferred response. So it would be weird if you would say, hey, for instance, say, uh, you would say, hey, JP, you want to be on my podcast? And I would say no. That sounds blunt. But if you say, hey, GP, you want to be on my podcast? And I say, yes, that sounds perfectly normal. So if I would have said no, I would have said, um, well, hesitate, hesitate, no, because uh, I'm kind of shy or I don't have time next year or whatever, it, 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 some kind of explanation. And so you can see these, these delays are, are meaningful. They, they tell the other person something, in this case, hesitancy. But there's also, people do also delay before they say something negative about another person, for instance. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Johnson, he's a bit of um, a dick. You know, so it, it's like, and it's the hesitation that signals to the listener that you are you are aware that it is something not nice that you're going to say. And yeah. and people like, for instance, Barack Obama, uh, if you look at his speeches, he was a master of using dramatic pauses. Yeah, and and, and har I think half of his drama came from his pauses, not from his speech. So they're really meaningful, hmm. and uh, and that makes it harder to study because you you never know is it is this just because somebody's slow slow processing, or because Somebody's very fast in processing. I thought maybe I shouldn't be so fast. So if it's both a signal and a symptom, that makes it hard. Yeah, it's like trying to interpret a missing data. Basically, it's like it's a pause. It's like you don't. Yeah, have, it's, you don't it's have like data. missing data that means something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's a missing data, but it means something that's <laughs> awful <laughs> from a statistical. Imagine standpoint. doing that from a statistical standpoint. That missing data meaning that that, yeah. that your missing data is one factor in your model. <laughs> yeah. Like, so how do you how do you add that to your regression? Oh, yeah. Good luck. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. But uh, yeah, I mean, and that's super interesting because also that. I mean, that could be used for humor. Ah, yes, humor. Is, I mean, the my, one of my favorite sources of, of language data is, is stand-up comedians. Mm, yeah. And it's really funny. If you take a stand-up comedian speech, like Trevor Noah, one of my favorites, mm -hmm. and if you just add or delete pauses, entire jokes can disappear. Yeah. It, yeah. It's amazing, really. It's a timing master, Trevor Noah. Yeah, exactly. And that's like... Timing for that. Also, you can have like the same the same sentence, but depending on how it's how right. it's said, it means something very bad or something that's yes. very funny. Yeah, that's uh, true. That's oh, super good. hard to <laughs> handle statistically. And that's the, the kind of things I like. Also, do you, do you study things like uh, punctuation, for instance? Like, yeah, something I like is if you say it's time to eat, mom, or it's time to eat mom, 
<laughs> okay, well, then, then, yeah, that's a syntactic version. Yeah, <laughs> it's the same. I didn't know that it's one. the that's same words. It's, there was just a comma between <laughs> yes, it and the, mom, the but it's really comma not the same is, meaning. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Good one. Yeah, the audible comma. Yeah, no, it, it is interesting, and I look at it, and I'm inspired by it. But we also, at the same time that we look at natural data, we also have in our in the back of our heads that we want to do scientific inference and that we need some variables controlled. So what we end up is a, with a compromise. For instance, one of my students, he does really brilliant work on initiation of repair. Mm -hmm. So that means someone says something and there is something vague or un there's something you don't hear right or understand right. And then you say, I'm sorry, what? Or who did you say? Or what did you mean? And she looks at the delay before people do that. Because there, again, there are two factors. One is that it's kind of face-threatening if you keep saying to someone, what, what, what? So you don't want to do that too lightly, and you want to delay it a little bit because it's an undispreferred term, as I explained earlier. On the other hand, uh, it's kind of urgent to do it because you don't want to get a misunderstanding. And there is a processing problem. So you have these three, these many factors that come together. And one of my uh, students uh, studied that, but it's very hard to get the right set from the natural data that you control for everything or as much as you can. This is where, uh, where sophisticated statistical designs help a lot. So perfect, because my ne next question would be, so then how does patient stat help you here? I'm guessing it's because like your, your data is very noisy, you must not have a lot of them, but I'm curious about, yeah, basically, why why do you use Bayesian stats at all, well, beyond yeah. the fact that it's much easier to interpret? Yeah, it's, thank you for saying that. It's really easy to interpret. I mean, it's like, it took my, of course, I had to convert my students because they were brainwashed in the p-value tradition, but it was surprisingly easy for them to use, for instance, base factors or posteriors to explain results because they they sort of make sense naturally anyone who says that p values make sense there's a 90% probability that they don't even know the definition and that's why they think it makes sense because they have the wrong definition in their head that helps and it it would help anyone i think not only in my field but there is one reason why it's especially good for our research uh, which is so Many people who are anti-Bayesian or frequentist apologists or whatever you call them, they point out correctly that if you have enough data, it doesn't matter. Mm. And that's true. If you have like yeah. if you have a particle accelerator and you have like five billion data points with with low noise, uh, you know, accurate, then whatever your inference is, you have enough data. It's no problem. And it doesn't matter whether you use five sigma or a base factor of a million or whatever, it will be there or it won't be there. But that's physics, uh, experimental physics at that. But in many or most behavioral fields, data are very hard to come by. And especially data in interaction research, because it's all spontaneous and natural data, and they're very, it's very hard to find it and to collect it, you have just basically a shortage of data. And there, it really matters whether you use p-values or, or Bayesian statistics, because the fewer data points you have, the more important it becomes that you have sensible priors to constrain your inference. And the great example of that is, now I'm embarrassed because I never know how to pronounce the guy's name, there's this uh, evolutionary anthropologist called, I think, Richard, Richard McElrath or something. I asked him once how to pronounce the name, and he said, just pronounce it any way you like. So I still don't know how to pronounce his name. I think he has even less data than I have in my field. And he was also a great proponent, educator of Bayesian methods. And he needs that because, you know, you, you need a sensible model if you have very few data. I mean, inference is, is very difficult to do at the best of times. I mean, you have a few data points and you conclude entire general theories from it. It's a weird procedure. And so you want to at least do it right with a consistent framework and with no uncertainties and stuff like that. So that's really helpful for us. Because we have so few data points and we still want to do some the best we can and know our uncertainties, that helps. Yeah, that makes sense. And so actually, you talked a, a bit about that already, but can you maybe take a, an example from your work, you know, maybe on speech timing to really illustrate basically what you do and how stats are related to what you do, basically, which kind of models you're using? Things like that. So one example, a recent study I'm right doing right now is where I try to predict, so if people say ah uh, or um, mm -hmm. we know from work by Clark and others that that signals a delay. 
in their speech. And I'm interested in what the the nature of the urn, uh, um, how that predicts the duration of the upcoming pause. So I define a model that says, now, okay, we have this kind of uh, this kind of pause. I have all these data about that in four different languages now. So if I have a model of how the nature of, in this case, the duration of that relates to the duration of the pause that follows it, I can do a pretty good job in predicting that given the right model. I won't bore you with the model, but the, the essential thing is that, for instance, uh, the old theory by Clark and Foxtree says, very simple, if it's an uh, it is a short delay, and if it's an um, it's a long delay. Mm. I want to compare that theory to my new theory, which is a little bit more elaborate and predicts better, but I want to know, because I also have more factors in the design, I also predict better. I want to know which of the theories is now more powerful. Now, if I define a Bayesian model, regression model for both, Mm -hmm. both the theory by Flark and Foxtree and my own, I can then uh, simply compute a base factor and, uh, and have a perfect measure of evidence for which one is more predictive than the other and correct for complexity. And that is relatively straightforward. You don't need any new, well, you need a base factor software, but you don't need any new theoretical invention for it. It's a it's simple, straightforward linear model. Model A, model B, discrete model, continuous model, base factor, and I find that it's like 17,000 times better predictive, so I know that I'm on to something. This mm. is one example of how I'm at the moment using using Bayesian statistics. Okay, I like that. But so one more thing, the, the most important thing, and this is also what always annoyed me by with the p-value statistics is that you have you can specify two models and compare them whereas in p-values which i always found ridiculous is you you say okay the data are very very unlikely under the null hypothesis which nobody is interested in and then you say oh because it's so unlikely under the null any other theory we have evidence for so you don't specify the theory that you're defending. You just only specify the negation of it, namely the null hypothesis. And if that is unlikely, you can say whatever you want. Mm. That is really funny. I mean, that's really a weird, it's almost an epistemic scam, really. Mm. It kind of matters what alternative theory you have for the null. Because Bayesian models allow you to basically specify theory A, theory B, and theory C, if you want, and then just directly compare their predictive adequacy. That is so straightforward. It's almost like real science, you know? Yeah, I could ask you about the footnotes uh, paper because that sounds fun. But I also want to talk about a bit more high level about your teaching and also the the bottlenecks that you see in the, the patient framework. So let me go there. Yep, so go ahead. that's awesome because I, I love the fact that you have experience in both frameworks and can really draw those bridges and comparisons. But since you're working the patient framework now, I'm wondering what you think are the biggest hurdles in the Bayesian workflow currently, especially in your field. What are the, the biggest difficulties, basically, that you have? No, so, first of all, it's not specific to my field, and that holds for the answer to my, your previous excellent question as well. These problems are, everyone has them. If, mm. As long as you try to use data to do inference on uh, and generalize that, it's always the same problem. So, I don't think there are specific problems in my field, other than that we just have very little data. Mm. but. I do teach statistics, uh, Bayesian statistics at undergrad and grad level. And there I find that the hurdle, and that's the same hurdle as I have and had, it is really tempting to confuse the probability of A given B with the probability of B given A. And not only statisticians and, and scientists do it, we, we all do it. You see it in the whole COVID discussion where people say, well, you know, uh, lots of people with that are vaccinated still get the disease. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but even more people who t- were not vaccinated get the disease. In essence, there is another given B versus B, B given A there. And it's it's like, uh, it almost looks like our fundamental cognitive flaw in, in mm. our thinking. Yeah, that's so incredibly hard to... It's just, it's so ingrained. And, yeah. Uh, there Even are actually, when you know you know, it's not the right answer, that's yeah. the first answer that will pop up in your head. Yeah. It's, it's so weird. It's, it's so strange. And, and yeah. that affects all of us. And that is something that, that is one of the hurdles. And in fact, if I may, if, if you allow me to tell a little bit of the teaching context, sure. what I found is that students find it even harder to realize that the probability of the data given the null hypothesis mm. plus the probability of the data given the alternative hypothesis is not one. 
And that's an even sneakier one because mm. it looks so it looks so obvious, you know. Of course, probability of the data given H nil plus probability of data given H one. H H one and H nil are mutually exclusive. So yeah. there we go. We add it up, but it's not true. It, it's the other one that's adding up to one, not this one. And data can be unlikely under H nil and H one. You know, and that is so hard to get for students, and for me too. I mean, we, you also have to. I was really interested in this your podcast with uh, Sir David Spiegelhalter mm-hmm. because he seems to have been, if I understood correctly, first exposed to Bayesian statistics. He must be one of the three people on the planet who first learned Bayesian statistics, and that's so different. That must be so different than than first learning uh, the other way around and then having to convert. Uh, that was not your question, and I'm sorry for that. I just got got uh, got off on the teaching angle. <laughs> no, that's great because I'm, I'm I have some teaching related questions, anyways. So you, you okay. already answered one of them. Now I'm like I'm a bit curious. Uh, can you just like explain, tell us how you make your student understand that p of h zero plus p of h one is not equal to one. And then we'll get back to my original question. I always fall back on a great example by, there is a great example, but I always have to look it up by EJ about this with with urns. Mm -hmm. But I usually try to start explaining them the difference between PH given B, PA given B is not the same as B given A by explaining to them that if my students read in a newspaper that I have died, say, that would be the, the conditioner, then what is the probability that I have jumped out of an airplane. Most students will think that is a low probability. Why would I? It's far likelier that I would be killed by a driver in Boston because I always use my bicycle and people in Boston are complete maniacs on the road. So the probability, given that I did, that I died in traffic is much higher than the probability that I died by jumping out of an airplane. Now let's turn it around. What is the probability if I jump out of an airplane that I die? That's kind of high, right? It's almost yeah, one. Yeah. Now, that's very different. One is almost zero. The other is almost one. Yeah. They're always a little bit shocked by the example, but I hope that the shock effect makes them remember it. Yeah. Do you know the prosecutor's fallacy? Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. a great one. Yes. So that, that's, that's the same. That ties in. I, I maybe should, next time I should use that uh, explicitly. Yeah. Yeah, I love it too. And I'll put the... I already talked about that on the podcast, so I'm not going <laughs> to reiterate but, it. But I would like to uh, apologize that I, I didn't answer your actual question when I started to get off on the teaching, which is the hurdle. And I do want to share what I think the hurdle is. Yeah, yeah, I, I'll get back to that right now. Um, sorry, I, did, I didn't lose track of that. That's, oh, yeah, what, no. that's my job here. Too, so don't you were very organized, yeah. So, But yeah, so uh, I'll put the prosecutor's fallacy in the show notes. Yes, yes, please. For those who are interested. And uh, like, of course, go back and listen to episode 50 with David Spiegel, how to we, we talk about the such topics in in depth. That was um, a great podcast. It's a, yeah, fascinating topics. I love I love those epistemological topics. And David is also a, a great guest. He's a fantastic, and he has such a great voice too. Like his deep, sonorous voice. True. <laughs> like true. you, you always have to believe him, whatever he says. <laughs> even though, even though he makes no pauses, yes, yeah, that's weird. Did no, he? he does. Don't worry. Okay. I just. I, I well, you deleted you. them. <laughs> no, I did not. But I'm messing with you. <laughs> I'm okay. trying to make you very mad and scream on the podcast to uh, have a marketing, you know, marketing boom of the podcast. So yeah. Uh, so let's go get back to my to my original question, uh, yes. which was about the the hurdles that you have in the, the hurdle. Yeah. Currently. So I have a kind of a controversial point of view on that. Um, Obviously, it is uh, it's difficult for people to change their their statistical habits. You have to learn something new things, and scientists are remarkably reluctant to learn new things. So that is understandable. The other thing is you have the reviewer problem, and we all know that we you send a paper to a journal, and the journal and the, the reviewer says, oh, "What is what is this uh, what is this Bayesian stuff?" And then you're like, oh, "Okay, uh, where do we start?" And so sometimes you're forced to go to give p values as well to satisfy the anxieties of the reviewers. Uh, so those are clear factors that have been identified that make it a hurdle for Bayesian. There's no hurdle in terms of software. I mean, we have perfect software for Bayesian. I mean, perfect, this can always be better, but you have EJ's JASP software, you have Stan, you have... There's a lot of... So, but I think the actual hurdle is that it is... The P is 0.05, the alpha is 0.05 standard in that is common in behavioral science is a really low bar. 
in terms of evidence. Mm. And it's it's sneaky because not only is the low bar, Jim Berger computed that uh, he has a conversion formula for p-values under optimal circumstances to base factors, which are likelihood ratios. And, and so Berger computed that the p is 0.05 under the best of circumstances is a, is a likelihood ratio of one to two and a half. It means that you're your alternative hypothesis is two and a half times as likely as your no hypothesis. That suddenly doesn't sound too impressive, but the general public thinks, and many scientists too, that because of the 0.05, that it's a 95 certainty, 95% certainty. So they have these illusions that it's like that the no hypothesis uh, has a probability of 5% or, or that it's that the alternative hypothesis is 95% true. It's all not actually the case. But it looks really confident, and it actually is a low bar. Mm. This is an absolute dream for scientists. You have very little work to do to prove something. It's kind of a lottery with a very positive stacking of decks. <laughs> and uh, so it's very easy to find evidence for something or cross the threshold for evidence. And then when you publish it, it looks like you're 95% certain. That is a dream situation. If we were to abandon that, for good reasons, because we have a replication crisis because of this, but if we were to abandon this standard and go Bayesian, say, say you want to have the same level of evidence that you thought you had with p-values. As my friend van der Kerkhoven Johan van der Kerkhoven from Irvine always jokes, but I'm, I'm not even sure it's a joke. If you want the same standard, you need a base factor of 90. You need a 19 over 1 likelihood ratio because then you get the 95%. And getting a 19 over 1 base factor needs far more evidence and better data than a P is 0.05. So there you go. To look at the microeconomics, people have to choose between either not learning something difficult and being very successful in publishing their stuff or learn something new after which it becomes harder to publish stuff. Mm. It's a no-brainer. Of course sure. that is a hurdle. Now think about it if, if it were the other way around. If, if, it were, if it were easier to find evidence with the Bayesian statistics paradigm, I think people would have already changed. Mm. But it's, 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 a, it's like a perfect the p-value, I'm sure Fisher didn't intend it like that or Gossett, but it's like a dream situation. You, you, you yeah. have very little evidence, you need very little evidence, and it looks like you're f completely confident. I mean, Yeah, that's bad incentive, for sure. <laughs> totally. It's, it's like, uh, and maybe not everyone is aware of the incentives, but the system as a whole has this, like, we want to publish, because if mm. we don't publish, you know, we perish. Mm. Yeah. It's easier to publish, and it, it looks cool, and, 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 and journalists say, oh, we're 95% sure. Well, yeah, but we aren't. Mm. It looks so like I think it. that is a very strong factor that, that, that makes it harder. You, you have to almost be a masochist. To, first, you have to learn and get a headache about uh, relearning your statistics. So that slows you down, gives you headaches, whatever. And then, as a reward for all this, it's harder to find evidence. Yeah. That sounds like a bad deal. Of course, for science, it would be fantastic, and we would probably have less of a replication crisis if it worked like that, but that's a long-term collective goal, and for the individual, there's hardly any reason to, to, to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So actually, that fits perfectly with my next question, which is, what does the future of patient stats in dialogue research look like to you? And more specifically, what would you like to see and what would you like to not see? Well, that's a tricky one. What I like to see is that people find it completely acceptable and normal to either present posterior probabilities or base factors in their research and, and, and use them, just basically accept them. I, I want to see the, them to become a default. If anyone ever invents a better paradigm, I'd be in favor of that. But as, as far as we are now... So I, I would like to have a statistical diversity, let me put it this way, mm -hmm. that people will accept Bayesian methods as uh, not being something quirky, but as the default, as, as a default, let me put it this way. Of course, it would be even better if people would abandon the NHST framework because I think it's it's dangerous for reasons I already explained. But but just acceptance that that becomes common that would be good. What I don't want to happen is what I actually unfortunately see happening is that some people have have created the convention that if you do Bayesian statistics, you need to get a base factor of at least three. Or if you want to have evidence for your null, which is possible in Bayes, great, one-third. That's the same as the three, but then you know the reciprocal. 
And the reason that this three comes up, I'm like, why three? That's very low. It's the same, it's the same as the one to two point five that I mentioned before. Well, it's exactly that because it sort of corresponds with the point oh five. That's not the point. We don't want to go Bayesian and then lower the bar again until we are at the low bar of uh, of, P, of alpha is 0.05. We want to do better. So what I don't want is that Bayesian, or, or that we got sort of what I call closet frequentist tests that are actually secretly doing p-values again with Bayes. Uh, a little bit like the, the rope procedure by Krushka. It's like, yeah, no, 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 that was the whole point. We don't want to go there. <laughs> you know? So so those are the, the things. Sometimes you get new uh, new paradigms and then they, with a lot of duct tape, are prepared to be like the old paradigm. That's what I hope is not going to happen. Yeah. So basically less hypothesis testing and arbitrary cutoffs, thresholds. That's what I hear here. Well, no, I'm st- to be honest, that's not what I mean. I mean, I'm not against arbitrary cutoffs. I just want sensible cutoffs. I mean, mm-hmm. okay, totally arbitrary. But I mean, I can understand that you don't want to have a discussion with editors or reviewers every time. Like, what is a good threshold? Do we mm-hmm. believe it when it's base factor 5 or 10 or 15? If a journal says, you know what, 90, that's our threshold, or 10. Or, point is, or alpha is 0.01, whatever. I can handle the, the the arbitrary threshold, but just not a low threshold. That's uh, something that I find important. Thanks for clarifying. So I'd like to switch now about a bit more about teaching. Is you already talked about that? Yeah. And, and so, I'm sorry it's... to mess up your uh, your school <laughs> plan. Perfect. That's good. That brings some diversity. I know. Uh, it's important to have some randomness. You know. As, I agree. As a modeler, I always for randomness. So. Because, yeah, you're a teacher, so uh, first, can you just quickly tell us at which level you teach Bayesian stats, and then come back to the main difficulties you notice people have when they are at that stage of the learning curve. Right. So the course in which I teach Bayesian stats is a course that is open to undergrads and grad students at the moment. And that makes sense because actually there is not much of a difference between undergrads and grads when it comes to switching your statistical habits. They're both new. It's new to both of them, usually. And in fact, the the undergrads are slightly more flexible because they haven't been brainwashed for so long. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they even have a head start in that course. So the the concept of level becomes hard to define if you teach something that is completely new. You know, if you like, uh, if you learn how to swim and then you learn how to swim fast and then you learn how to dive and then you learn how to snorkel, there's a cumulative thing going on. First you learn this, then or first you learn calculus, then you learn complex calculus and so on. There's like a building of new stuff on new on old stuff but if you start if you start at the basics of statistics the inference problem and you want to completely start from a new point it doesn't really matter it's, it's, it could actually be a hindrance to have a, a previous education okay it helps if they can do math but that's or if they can program that is a great help too but so those fundaments need to be there. But in terms of thinking, it doesn't really matter. So I don't see levels there, actually. I was a full professor when I was a student of EJs when it came to Bayesian statistics, and I probably was slower in the uptake than my, my own undergrads right now. Hmm. Yeah. And the, yeah, sometimes ignorance is pretty bliss. <laughs> uh, that doesn't mean that it's easy for those people to learn. So what do you think are the main, what did you notice are the main difficulties that your students have when they start learning Bayesian statistics? I think it's very hard for them to, well, first of all, the things I already mentioned, and I don't know if if you want me to repeat them or you want to edit anything out, that's fine. But the flipping of probabilities, the conditional probability AB versus BA is a big problem for all of us and Mm -hmm. and especially for students. So they they often can't wrap their head around that. Mm. It's very hard to, to overcome their brainwashing of p-values that basically what they've learned is it's always the other way around that you think and that is of course recursively applied very confusing because Mm. then they learn the new thing they also think it's the other way around and at some point you get messed up so they're basically confused and deconfusing them is very difficult and uh, thinking about and it's actually it's really hard basically to to keep these two apart 
The other thing is that they see because of the null hypothesis thing, like you reject the null and then you're fine, they're not used to thinking about models. So one of the first things I let my students do is just have some real psychological phenomena and have them make up a model, just whatever, as long as it predicts the outcome. Can be right, can be wrong, can be stochastic, can be deterministic, but predict something with a model. And I use that to sort of basically open their minds to the possibility that you do need a model. So the no is not the only model. You need an alternative model as well. What are you actually saying about the world? And then the students always say, well, we can't be sure. Well, okay, well, then make it with a high uncertainty. Uh, that's fine too. You know, the idea that you can say things with uncertainty in it and that that's legitimate science mm -hmm. is something that is both important and hard to learn. Okay, yeah, I like that. So basically the the fact of becoming okay with uncertainty being there is yeah. hard for most of your students. Yes, yeah, so maybe you know, I don't know, you probably know better than me what the name of that illusion is, but there is this famous illusion that many students have like... Uh, what was it again? Oh, yeah. The, anything that has two possible outcomes, therefore, has a probability of 50%. Oh, okay. No, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Say, say that I don't know whether you are married or not. Well, you either are or you aren't, so that's 50%. That is, whereas there might be other reasons that I think it's more probable or less probable. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of an interesting paradox. It's actually a great way of illustrating is the, the multi-hole problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because they implicitly assume that uh, that that if they change their choice in the multi hole, it's the same as not changing, where because of the fifty fifty illusion, but it's not. It's you should actually change your mind, and that's a, a very tricky one. And and what also they, what they find very difficult is to express their uncertainty in priors. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do it every day in their real life, in their in their daily lives. Because mm -hmm. you know, if if I say I I want to I want to go to CVS, which is the local pharmacy here, to buy some almond which I'm fond of, and I don't know whether it's open or not. Well, it's 8 o'clock in the evening, and the other CVS is open till 10, but this one is smaller. What is my probability? I would, uh, maybe, if I think the probability is 80%, I would go and go into the snow again and try to get my almonds. If I think, well, it's probably 20%, I won't. That's really difficult to express this uncertainty and, and, and to basically use math to sculpture functions that express your uncertainty it's actually that they have the knowledge they know their uncertainty that's not the problem it's the it's how to put it out in a, in a formalism that makes it hard hmm, yeah am i still making any sense yeah no and maybe it could also be because it feels weird to them because it feels not objective yes well that's the that's the more um philosophical is, uh, issue about so I was actually referring to the technical issue of a meta parameter that you have uncertainty about your uncertainty. Yeah. Of course, the idea that you express your uncertainty before you do inference—that's the other thing you're now referring to. Many people are afraid of of doing that because it's subjective. Yeah. But if I have to, and it and it is on the other hand, it's in the open, so everybody knows about it. So if if, if I don't like your prior, I can just change it and see what happens. Yeah. And have an open discussion discussion about it. Whereas if you do an experiment seven times and only report the 17th I don't even know about it and so it looks objective but it is actually not so yeah that's a very difficult point to get across yeah that's true in fact yeah. if I may insert a small anecdote my father once donated to me a copy of a very expensive book by um, James Edward James uh, the logic of science and it's there's two reasons he gave it to me well three actually one is he thought it was too difficult fair enough Second, it, he gave it to me, he didn't want to throw it away because it was very expensive and he was Dutch, so he didn't want to throw away money. And the third reason was that it assumed that you have a prior. And he thought that was so ridiculous that he didn't want to read that book because who would do that? And what he didn't know was that his own geophysicists, because he was an oil geologist, do that every day to uh, interpret seismic data. So I had a lot of fun uh, asking his colleague, seismic, guy to tell my father that they actually have priors and he was very shocked to hear that this is just to illustrate that some people have this but in the end i had a copy of james like a real copy that's it's cool. like 250 euros and i got yeah. it for free because my father didn't believe in priors so that's cool yeah if that happens again uh, you'll be interested postal address yeah 
for sure. <laughs> okay. um, that's definitely cool. a book that I'd, I'd love to have in my in my library. That's for sure. Yeah, that's cool. And yeah, so uh, so, so many things uh, I'd like to, to add about that, but we're already uh, over time. Uh, I refer people to episode 51 with Aubrey Clayton, where we talk a lot about Jane's work. And uh, I haven't even heard that one. Okay. Uh, perfect. Well, then listen to it. Uh, yeah, Aubrey wrote a book called uh, Bernoulli's Fantasy. Oh, yeah, that book. Oh, yes. Okay. Sorry. I know I know the book, but I don't know the podcast episode. Yeah, well, he was here on episode 51. Oh, fantastic. And, we talked about the book and, and his work and so on. So, yeah. I look forward um, to that. Really, really, really interesting episode too. And so I'll refer people to to that. I, I put the links in the show notes. And also I put the link in the show notes to the page, Wikipedia page of the Monty Hall problem. Because that's ah, yes. Legendary yes. thing. Yes. For sure. I'll send you some more links. Yeah. The links about the papers, the two papers you mentioned, uh, for sure, we, we need that. Remind me which ones and when you sent me an email. Yeah, so uh, I think the first one was the, the one about the honking. Uh, yeah, study. I wrote that down. Yeah. And the second oh, one. Oh, and the uh, sex, yes, I got it. Yep. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Actually, a uh, question I, I like to, to ask is, if you think that there are mistakes that every student should make when they start learning patient statistics, that mistakes that are that bite you and then stay in your brain and makes you learn actually way better? Mistakes? Uh, that's a really difficult question. I think the mistakes that they have to make are the mistakes they're probably making. That, that's <laughs> how nature works. So that's good. So um, I'm thinking back of the of the flipping of the probabilities. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I wouldn't know, to be honest. Hmm. Other than the mistakes, that, I think they should make the mistakes they're making. That That's my best answer. Hmm. So perfect. Means, means they are on the, the right path. Yeah, it is like, it's basically using the like that kind of way that the brain has to work, which is mistakes are more costly for us because losses are more costly. And so when you make a mistake, you remember it more vividly yes. than when you have a success. And so sometimes mistakes are very good because they they help you understand something faster and yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that's good. That's why also I, I like mistakes. Me too. Yeah, it's like running into a lamppost every time until it hurts so much that you think that yeah. next time we're going around it. Exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, then I'm wondering, like, what are the main skills that you try to instill in your students? Okay, so every course or interaction I have with students is actually secretly the same thing. I hope my students won't listen to this podcast. <laughs> but uh, I'm always basically always trying to teach them philosophy of science. Uh, well, rather applied philosophy of science. Mm. It's like, it's ridiculously hard to look at the world and use observation to infer general things about it. Mm -hmm. It's an underestimated problem. And most what I'm most focused on is that my students see through when this process is incorrect. Because there is so much hot air and suspect theories out there these days, like I call them feel-good theories, things that people want to believe and have some evidence for, but actually don't. My basic obsession is to train them to to see when something is not correct, where you cannot draw the conclusion from the argument or the data. If I succeed in that, I'm always very happy. Sometimes I, I, I get like feedback that colleagues of mine had a student in their lecture and the student completely uh, demolished their argument. And I always like look very concerned, but secretly I'm like, yeah, 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 that was good. Good student. Because that's how I try to train them. And if you do, if you're good at that, you're all automatically good at doing things that do make sense. Because you have reflexes to avoid the mistakes. Yeah, and it's kind of like once you know more about epistemology and philosophy of science and how how we know what we know, basically, it's right. like it's the basis of everything. So yes, yes. Once you once you know that, that definitely makes you a better scientist for sure. Oh, so yeah. okay, yeah, I love that. So truly, I hope, I hope you're. Students will hear, will listen to me to the episode. Uh, yeah, that's that's not uh, that would be <laughs> embarrassing. <laughs> okay, well, um, one of the last questions before uh, leaving you, be, but I had to ask because now you actually use PyMC in your in your teaching. So yep. 
I'm curious why and also what do you like and what you would like to see improved in the package. What I like is that my students don't have to learn another language because they, they huh. usually already know Python and we do some other stuff in Python. So it's great that it's the same language. And it's actually uh, thanks to some diligent work of one of my grad students, Chaz, who uh, convinced me to start using it because he found out that all the examples in the, he's my TA in the course and sometimes teaches us together with me. And he, he found out that a lot of examples from the book by Lee and Wagenmakers that we use. Maybe we could have put a link to that as well. That's a great book to, to teach uh, Bayesian modeling. But all the examples there have been done in PyMC3. So that means that uh, saves me a lot of time at work. So we can use them in class. So th this was the first year that we used uh, PyMC3. So there were some hiccups, of course. And it turned out that my computer cannot run PyMC3, which is another hiccup, so I had to use it online. And we will fix that. But it's great that it's uh, it's in Python. It is also very flexible. It, it uses multiple sample samplers, through, uh, and they can mix samplers. I think that is more flexible than Stan, actually. I'm not sure. Don't shoot me if I'm wrong. But I think it's more flexible than Stan. Which is great because I want to do late variables, discrete late variables, because that's the, the fun part of Bayesian modeling, I think. So that helps. Uh, what I don't like, well, first of all, I don't like that it is using the Python class system, which is like a very, very afterthought kind of class system. It, it, Python is not the language you want to do object-oriented programming, and that's basically my point of view here. It is not the right language to do it. So you, you get all this duct tape, like weird variables with 17 underscores to uh, define things, and, and, and you only have one constructor for classes, which is absurd and very difficult. So I'm not a fan of that, no. I wish that they had implemented it just with procedures and not as, uh, as classes. But I see that that also has disadvantages, but that sort of gives me a headache all the time. And the other thing is uh, that PyMC3 doesn't use base factors, have offer base factors for model comparison. But a very, very, very smart colleague of mine who used to be in one of your podcasts is uh, is working on that now. Oh, really? Yeah, so uh, I think she wants to do it in Arvis, and uh, oh. I don't care where it is as long as it works. Wait, because that's Karen? Yes. Ah, of so, course, Karen. Well, Karen, if you listening to us yep. hi and i'm so excited about this because yeah. it's so important for the students to be able to so you, you you teach them that was always my problem you teach them modeling like with jags oh model a model b and then you want to compare them and all you have is this really limited uh, information criteria and it's much more fun to directly compare the the predictive adequacy with a base factor because didactically that is fantastic for the students but then it has to work i mean you know uh, so i hope that next next year when i offer it next semester when i offer it that there is some way to do base factors in the yeah no RVs, pressure Karen. RVs <laughs> would, would definitely be the yeah. place to do that yeah, yeah for sure that's that'd be so so good yeah so thanks a lot for your work on that uh, Karen. Absolutely. Uh, that's awesome. And so anyway, anybody interested in that actually can go to the RV's GitHub and uh, signal her interest in, in working on that and helping Karen on that uh, PR. That's for sure. Awesome. An awesome contribution first and also great experience for you if you want to start diving into Bayesian stats and the open source world and the data. And for the record... This is possible because of uh, Quentin Gronau's work, who created this bridge sampler implementation for calculating the marginal probabilities, which was a very difficult problem. Yeah, for sure. It's already in Stan, and uh, therefore, I think it would be uh, very good if it's also available in PyMC3, if only to uh, compete with Stan. <laughs> you know how to drive us. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very sneaky, very, very <laughs> short, but Shit. very sneaky sentence. You're on to me. Yeah. yeah. I'm going to edit that out for sure. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Awesome. And yeah, uh, I put a link to the PyMC3 port of um, AJ Wagenmacher's yes, uh, yes, yes, book thank you. In, the, in the show notes for the people who are interested. Yes. So we're getting. Short on time, already running long. Thanks a lot for taking so much time, JP. So, but I really, very fast, what's the next thing that you want to learn? Learn. Okay, there's a long list of things that are embarrassingly unrealistic, but I wish I were 200 years old to do that, but I can't. But uh, I think the next thing I want to learn, I'm actually starting already, is causal modeling. Mm, okay. 
Cool. Yeah, I saw you added a, a causal modeling intro playlist from YouTube in the show notes. It should be just a link to Michael McElrath's uh, course, which is a very good intro. Yeah, yeah, very uh, good. Yeah, that, that's, I, I think it's essential for science to do that. And it's really surprising that we only got to that now in the 21st century or maybe late 20th century. And it's not taught yet, but it's really essential. Mm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, I do see that in in some of my work for uh, with uh, with clients at PNC Labs. That sometimes uh, causal inference is going to save the day. Depends on what you're doing and the question you have, but often it's important. Okay, awesome. Thanks a lot, JP. Of course, before letting you go, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every guest. Ah, yes, the, the questions. Sure. Yes. So first one. If you had unlimited time and resources, which problem would you try to solve? I would try to solve the problem. I would probably fail, but I would try to solve the problem how how we have consciousness. Mm. We are mm. physical units, physical entities, and we do have consciousness. We are aware. Mm. We have pain. We have joy. We experience things. How can matter experience things? That's something that is, I think, the most unsolved, the most important unsolved mystery of our time, and nobody has a cue, a clue. I think. Uh, that's that. That's what I would uh, spend my unlimited resources and time on. Nice. Sounds like a very easy problem to solve. Though. Yeah, yeah. It's peanuts. Yeah, just need some time. <laughs> <laughs> then you can just relax. That's yes. perfect. Yeah. So, second question: If you could have dinner with any great scientific mind, dead, alive, or fictional. Who would it be? That would be Richard Feynman. Nice. Yeah, he was fantastic. He, did, he not only understood physics at the level that was unsurpassed, but he also so well understood the logic of science. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and he was also a very funny guy. So, I mean, three reasons to definitely want to have dinner. He's very dead, unfortunately. But if I had the chance, I would love to have dinner with him. That's cool. Yeah, I thought you were going to say E.T. James to get your book signed. Yeah, he, okay. uh, yeah, he was on my list, but he's a bit grumpy. Uh, I think uh, <laughs> Feynman would be a lot more fun to yeah. have dinner with. Yeah, that's a common opinion for sure. <laughs> and okay. uh, please invite me when you have Yes, dinner. yes. Okay, I will. Awesome. Okay. Let's call that a show, a long show. <laughs> so uh, thanks a lot, JP. That was awesome. I learned a lot and you have a very interesting path. So I love that. As usual, I put resources and a link to your website in the show notes for those who want to dig deeper. Thank you again, JP, for taking the time. And it was my pleasure. Show. It was an honor to be here. Yeah, you bet. Come back anytime uh, with Richard Feynman. Yes. <laughs> See you. See you. Bye. This has been another episode of Earning Patient Statistics. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show on your favorite podcatcher or on Podchaser, and visit learnbasedstats.com for more resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes that will help you reach true patient state of mind. That's learnbasedstats.com. Our theme music is Good Patient by Baba Brinkman with MC Lars and Megaran. Check out his awesome work at bababrinkman.com. I'm your host, Alex Andorra. You can follow me on Twitter at Alex underscore Andorra, like the country. You can support the show and unlock exclusive benefits by visiting patreon.com slash learn base stats. Thanks so much for listening and for your support. You're truly a good base and change your predictions after taking information in. And if you're thinking I'll be less than amazing, let's adjust those expectations. Let me show you how to be a good base and change calculations after taking fresh data in. Those predictions that your brain is making. Let's get them on a solid foundation. Yeah.